but privately, he was troubled. It seems that Moctezuma was a passive individual, perhaps even a depressive individual. Legend says that when he witnessed a comet streaking across the skies over Tenochtitlan, he spent the rest of the night in tears. As the weeks went by, he became increasingly paranoid. But at the height of his obsession with the supernatural, a very real threat approached from across the sea. Spies posted along the Gulf Coast reported strange sightings offshore that they were at a loss to describe. They never have seen a boat, so they didn't even have a word to, 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 to describe that. So the Indians refer to those boats as mountains that move in the water. In 1519, after sailing from Cuba, Cortez landed with 11 of these floating mountains and 500 men on the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles southeast of Tenochtitlan. The tribes were astonished by these men with metal armor and animals they had never seen. As he moved inland, tribes who resisted were brutally slaughtered, but many others were happy to provide him with provisions and men. One of the ways in which one local lord down on the Gulf Coast curried favor was to give Cortez and his company a group of women who were to not only provide for them in housekeeper sort of manner, but were also clearly meant to be courtesans as well and provide sexual services to them. But among the concubines, one in particular caught the eye of Cortez himself. She was the daughter of a chieftain who had been sold into slavery and was called La Malinche. They developed an intimate relationship, and in time, she bore a son to him. And he would have been one of the first people of mixed blood in the New World. But she was much more than a mistress. She became an interpreter for Cortez, and her role expanded to advisor and intermediary between him and the Aztecs. Not only was she his translator, but she could also tell him about things that were being said that he was not intended to hear or understand. Moctezuma's network of relay runners kept him apprised of the Spaniards' movements. It was clear they were headed for his city. As he advanced toward Tenochtitlan through the summer of 1519, Cortez amassed an army of thousands. Moctezuma's army of warriors numbered in the hundreds of thousands. They wore animal costumes on the battlefield to intimidate their opponents. Part of it was spectacle. You had just incredible costumes that the different warriors would wear. The most important warriors were knights, dressed as jaguars and eagles. The Aztec knights were initiated into their orders at sacred ceremonies at special temples like this one. This is the cave temple at Malinalco, one of six temples on this remote mountainside a few hours south of Mexico City. It was finished by Moctezuma II around 1502, shortly after his coronation. Now, over in Europe, Michelangelo was pounding out the David for the Republic of Florence. But while Michelangelo was carving the David, the Aztecs were here carving this temple right out of the side of this mountain. And it is the only temple in the entire Western Hemisphere built in this manner. At the bottom of the stairs, of Kualcali are the sculptures of two jaguars. On each side of the door, there are the remnants of two warriors. Now, the door itself represents the open mouth of a giant serpent. You can literally see its tongue coming out of the room. The Aztecs believed that this was the entrance to the womb of the earth. Now, the privileged warriors would come here, go into the room with sculptures of eagles, have their noses pierced, and offer blood and sacrifice to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. But this would be by no means the last time these Aztec warriors would spill their blood. The first meeting between Cortez and Moctezuma 
would be peaceful. But the conquistador knew a huge and bloody clash between the old world and the new would soon take place. And the annihilation that ensued would become one of the most frightening events in the history of the Americas. Cocoa beans were so valuable a commodity to the Aztecs, they were even used as a currency. It is the fall of 1519. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés has finally reached the gleaming Aztec capital he has heard so much about, Tenochtitlan. When the Spaniards first saw Tenochtitlan, they thought they were in some kind of an enchanted vision. They thought they'd entered some kind of a dream. A massive force of native warriors allied against the Aztecs accompanies him as he advances on the main causeway into the city. The meeting of Cortes and Montezuma on a causeway approaching Tenochtitlan had to be one of the most remarkable events in world history. It's really a, a, a meeting of two different worlds. And Cortez offered his hand, but the minute he started to do that, to actually touch Montezuma, the noble attendants around Montezuma pushed Cortez away and said, no, 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 that's, that's a total indignity. Nobody touches Montezuma, the great lord of the land. The meeting of the two worlds was peaceful, but fraught with tension. Moctezuma by this time had become increasingly impulsive and prone to bouts of hysteria. So the encounter was a, an, an encounter of, of sensing the, the, the forces no, in each side. But the Aztecs had a diplomacy and a warfare system that was somewhat naive in comparison to the very tricky and sly system of the Europeans. Moctezuma invited the Spaniards to stay in one of his palaces. It would prove to be a catastrophic mistake. As the Spaniards entered the city, they were so awed they thought they were dreaming. At the heart of the city stood the emperor's colossal palace. The palace of Moctezuma II was a massive complex spread across six acres near the great temple. One of the Spaniards noted that every day at Moctezuma's palace, 600 nobles gathered, and they would hear the word of their emperor. Moctezuma received the Spaniards in a large reception chamber just beyond the main entrance, designed to make the emperor appear omnipotent. But Moctezuma's palace would be the last ever built by the Aztecs. Not a week into their visit, the Spaniards went for the jugular, kidnapping Moctezuma. It was an audacious move, but it paid off. The empire appeared to be theirs. Even though Moctezuma was still the official leader of the city, it was, he was really, for some time, nothing more than a mouthpiece for Cortez. For six months, tensions within the walls of Tenochtitlan slowly simmered. Then, in the spring of 1520, it all came to a head. One morning, Spanish soldiers interrupted a sacred sacrifice and slaughtered those taking part. The move sparked an uprising. For the Aztecs, the Spaniards had committed an unspeakable sacrilege. The city became engulfed in chaos as the Aztecs marched on Moctezuma's palace. Moctezuma gets up on the top of the palace and tries to talk to the people and calm them down, and by now they're just not having any of it. Moctezuma had become nothing more than the Spaniard's puppet, a betrayal so great in the eyes of his people, they pummeled him with rocks and arrows. Shortly after, Moctezuma's lifeless body was tossed from the palace walls. Whether he died at Spanish hands or from injuries inflicted by his own people may never be known. And the Spaniards at that point decide this would be a, probably a good time to leave the city. On the night of June 30th, 1520, the Spaniards attempted to escape under cover of darkness. But they can't separate themselves from the plunder that they've gotten so far, so they're weighted down with all of the things that they want to take with them. 
They were easy targets for the Aztec warriors who caught them on the causeway. Bodies quickly piled up in the water. 400 Spaniards were killed along with several thousand of their Indian allies. That escape has, has come to be called the Noche Triste, the sad night. Cortez and a few others managed to escape with their lives. The Spaniards would now destroy the shining city of Tenochtitlan for good. He would begin by severing the lifeblood of the city, the aqueduct. As hundreds of thousands of people within the city's walls were without water, Cortez created a blockade around Tenochtitlan to cut off all outside supplies of food. So the idea of this uh, blockade was to try to, sur to make surrender the city by hunger. And the Aztecs had a tremendous resistance, so they couldn't be defeated easily. And what they decided to do is to mount a, an attack both by land and by sea. For centuries, the lake around Tenochtitlan was a barrier against invaders. But Cortez would find a way around that. He had thousands of his Indian allies carry ships in pieces up thousands of feet over the mountains to be assembled and launched into the lake. May 1521. Cortez unleashes his massive army in a final decisive attack on Tenochtitlan. 600 Spaniards, including 100 cavalrymen and upwards of 50,000 of their Indian allies, clash with the Aztec defenders of the city on its grand causeways. Brutal fighting continued for months. Day by day, Cortez raised the city block by block. He and his Indian allies were merciless in their systematic slaughter of the population. It was an extremely hard fought battle, especially in the city precincts. The Aztecs made a last stand at the great temple in Tlatelolco. Warriors lined the steep steps to rain down arrows and rocks on their enemy. But it was hopeless. On August 13th, the final Aztec leader, Cuauhtémoc, was captured and surrendered to Cortez. And that was just the beginning. 20 million would die of disease brought by the Spaniards. By the end of the 16th century, we estimate that the native population had been reduced by about 90 percent. Modern-day Mexico City has been built atop the rubble of the once majestic city of Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards leveled it during the construction of their own colonial capital, even using stones from the great temple to build their cathedral still standing next to the temple ruins. The Aztec Empire had vanished, and with it, a legacy of astonishing engineering achievements. It has become clear from their sophisticated systems of urban planning, agriculture, and waterworks that the Aztecs stood among the most advanced of the world's great empires. The cave temple here at Malinalco is one of the few truly impressive Aztec achievements that the Spanish did not destroy. And stunning sights such as this beg the tantalizing question, if the Spanish had not come, what would Mexico look like today? I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel.